Good afternoon. It's so great to see everyone today. We have a large audience here and we have some very important information. This year with changes in the law, we've had a lot of calls into our center where people are really confused about, about what's going on with dyslexia. Why am I getting information that says my child looks like they have some characteristics and people are in RTI and they're not sure whether they want to continue RTI or go for an evaluation or how to proceed. So we think this is a very timely webinar by people who are absolutely experts in dyslexia. So as again, we have Dr. Sarah Rich and Dr. Gary Duhon. They have in the information, I think their background, I hardly have to say anything to introduce them. They're so well known, um, but they are both associated with OSU and the Bridge Center. And they work a lot in the area of dyslexia and with children and with disabilities and supporting school systems for dealing with behavior, dyslexia, different um, kinds of things. I will, before we get started, I saw some information about some people not really getting in with sound. So um, there was some questions about no sound. Is there a mute button? So if you're having trouble with sound, will you please let us know in the chat? Um, that was before the webinar started. So I just want to make sure that we're all on board and Rob can check into that if you're having any difficulties. So again, we're excited for Dr. Sarah Rich and Dr. Gary Duhon to give us this very valuable information. So there you go, guys. Thank you, Joanne and Rob. We appreciate it and are so excited to see such a great turnout and everyone here um, as, as can attest to everyone being here. This is a hot topic. Um, so myself and Dr. Duhan, we are school psychologists. As Joanne mentioned, we both work for OSU. I'm in the Center for Health Sciences here in Tulsa, and um, a big part of my job is working with kids who have been evaluated or referred for evaluation, either due to learning concerns, I get a lot of dyslexia referrals, and but also behavioral and social emotional things as well. So that's my day to day practice. And then Dr. Duhan is trainer of school psychology in Stillwater and training our future school psychologist out there and in working on this um, area on a weekly basis with his graduate students that he's training. So we are excited to be here. We're excited to present to you um, the what the research says and what the guidance says from Oklahoma on dyslexia. So with that in mind, I'm going to put in the chat for everyone a link to the presentation. As Rob said, this will also be available on their website with the recording. So we want to make sure you guys have access to all the materials that we talked about today. And then I'm going to turn it over to, um, well, first go through the objectives here. So the um, hopefully by the end of today, you will understand why dyslexia is so complex and why it's causing so much confusion because it's a really complex topic to talk about. Um, the basic requirements and what it means in Oklahoma and then recognizing how to communicate with parents or if you are a parent, what you should understand about dyslexia in Oklahoma. All right, Dr. Duhan, it is all you now. <laughs> all right. Thanks for having me, guys. And uh... We're going to try to uh, get through some basics here. I'm going to start and I'm going to do the first half of the presentation, or the first part of it, and Dr. Rich is going to finish this up. But first off, let's talk about uh, what dyslexia is, because in the field, in the general, in the public consciousness, dyslexia is a lot of different things. And right now we're getting a lot of our information about what dyslexia is from things like Google and um uh, television, and that's not the place to get it from. So let's uh, do a quick survey. And uh, Dr. Rich dropped a, um, a, a, a Google, a poll, poll everywhere into uh, the chat. I uh, hope you guys can see that. Uh, Dr. Rich, how will this work? Help, help me out. I'm an old guy. <laughs> so, so if you guys will click click on that link that was just dropped, the poll of dot com, and that's going to give you just a quick 
question about what is dyslexia and the definitions. And I'm going to give you all like a minute or less than a minute to fill that out. And then I should be able to switch over to the live poll and show the results here um, in just a second. So um, please click on that. As you guys are filling it out, there's a list of four different definitions of dyslexia. Which do you think is the best definition or what have you heard before as a definition of dyslexia? He'll give you a few seconds and then I will switch it for. Okay. And did the screen switch to the poll? Make yep. sure. Okay. Perfect. Looks so great. Uh, so we had four definitions up there. Uh, dyslexia means an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has uh, the intelligence uh, to be a much better reader, most commonly caused by difficulties in phonological processing. 10% responded to that one. Specific, dyslexia is a specific learning disability uh, that is neurobiological in origin and is characterized by difficulties uh, with accurate and or fluent word recognition. Uh, and uh, by poor spelling and decoding abilities, 63% uh, indicated that one, which is uh, the winner so far. C, 13% indicated that dyslexia is a specific learning disability difficulty, which mainly affects the development of literacy and language related skills. It is likely to be present at birth and uh, to be lifelong in its effect. And 15% indicating that dyslexia is a specific uh, difficulty that primarily affects the skills involved in accurate and fluent word reading and spelling. Characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal memory, and verbal processing speed. Uh, so the predominant response was B, but here's the kicker. They're all somewhat accurate. They all have some aspects of correctness in them but we see this quite a bit is confusion about what dyslexia is and some here, but I'm impressed uh, B was the most accurate response. So, and I will say, um, just so you guys know where these definitions came from, that first one is um, in a federal legislation called the um, First Step Act. The second one, which most people chose, and I, I think probably why is because that's what the Inter International Dyslexia Association says. So that's, that is one that I see out there a lot. And then the last two are actually from the UK. Um, and so in British language um, and what they say for dyslexia and their legislation, and then in a reading report that they did. So, so it's complicated and to, to, to compound that complication, there's a lot of other definitions out there. There's a lot of other definitions that aren't even close to accurate, but it gets into the uh, sort of pop culture and, un and the general understanding of, of people, and they're looking for those issues, and they're trying to define it themselves, and they're trying to diagnose it at home with a Google survey, and that's just not that, it's just not that simple. So uh, as, as uh, the picture indicates, it's complicated. So let's talk about definitions of dyslexia. What is dyslexia? Well, first, let's break the term down a little bit more. Uh, dys means disorder. Lexia uh, refers to language. So in its simplest form, dyslexia is a disorder in language or language development. Um, and what does that look like? What does that mean? Well, often used to describe difficulties to learn to read and spell, in most peer-reviewed publications on dyslexia, the term dyslexia and specific learning disability are used interchangeably. And you'll see that as we move forward, uh, those terms are used interchangeably, both from a research perspective and from a legal perspective. Uh, they are not different things. You don't have either a specific learning disability or dyslexia. Dyslexia is considered a specific learning disability. So let's look at how we're defining it in Oklahoma. And as, as much as I'd like to say we're on, on one page in Oklahoma, there's some differences in how we're laying this out. Oklahoma law has a specific definition that's laid out right there. I won't read the whole thing. Uh, the Oklahoma State Department of Education has defined dyslexia, but there are some common commonalities. And even in the dyslexia handbook, they're not defining dyslexia per se in the handbook 
uh, that's out there that has been created by the Oklahoma State Department of Education, but they're talking about what, what we're looking for or, or how it affects students. So common themes with these definitions, specific learning disorder, accurate word recognition, poor spelling, decoding, these things are common and phonological components are often believed to be associated with it. So the agreed upon features in all those definitions and in most of uh, the literature, it is uh, dyslexia, it has, there are difficulties in accurate and fluid word recognition. So learning how to um, accurately read and learning how to fluently read, uh, difficulties with spelling and decoding of novel words becomes problematic also. And it typically has something to do with or are believed to be associated with weaknesses in phonological awareness or deficits in phonological awareness. Now, as a result of these issues, as a result of these basic features of dyslexia, it may lead or include problems with comprehension. So if you're not reading accurately or if you're not reading fluently, uh, comprehension is going to be affected. It also re uh, reduces reading experiences, makes reading harder, makes reading unpleasant, and impedes growth in vocabulary and background development. And that last piece impedes growth with vocabulary and, ba and background knowledge is usually a byproduct of kids with dyslexia read less. So they're exposed to less language and exposed to less literature. So their development is, is severely affected and, 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 and uh, diminished. So now when we th think about reading as a, as a skill, as a phenomena, there's, uh, we, we oftentimes talk about the simple view of reading. Now, reading is all obviously more complex than this, but at its core, we can break it down into two com major components, word recognition and language comprehension. These things come together to produce reading comprehension, which is the purpose of reading, to gather meaning from text. Now, word recognition is the ability to uh, memorize words accurately and fluently read those words and when you come across novel words to decode them uh, using your basic decoding skills. Language comprehension is the ability to understand language um, and essentially what the words mean that we come across on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you're, uh, most kids have good language comprehension but struggle with word recognition and that's where we see most of the kids we're talking about when we're, at, when we're asking the questions about dyslexia. And if you break that down into possible combinations that you may see in the field, it looks a little like this. Uh, left to right, you're looking at weak word recognition to strong rec word recognition. The kids on the left are kids who struggle with word recognition and decoding skills. The kids on the right uh, are kids who have good decoding skills and good word recognition skills. The kids at the top have good language comprehension and the kids at the bottom have poor language comprehension. And these two dimensions uh, break down into four different possibilities. One, that blue box top right, are kids who have strong language skills and strong word decoding skills. They're, they're strong, they have strong word recognition and strong language comprehension. These kids read well. Uh, they generally do well with just core instruction, just whatever is delivered in the context of the general education classroom. If you look to the left of that, in the green box, these are specific word recognition difficulties. These kids have difficulty learning how to read quickly and fluently. Uh, and they also struggle with decoding novel words. They may have good oral language skills, they may have good vocabulary, but they really struggle with decoding those words. So like I said before, even though their oral comprehension is good, their reading comprehension is gonna struggle because they're not accurately reading or fluently reading. Now the kids right below that in the dark brown box, these are our mixed kids. They have They struggle with, word uh, recognition, but they also struggle with language comprehension. Oftentimes you'll see these kids, uh, they're ELL kids, they, they have uh, their learning English is not their first language, or they come from a, a background where they've not been exposed to a lot of uh, diversity in language. And so they struggle with basic language comprehension, and they also struggle to read. These are our most difficult kids. To the right of those in that light brown box, 
those are the kids who can decode accurately and fluently, but they struggle with uh, simple oral comprehension. These are our specific reading comprehension difficulties. Now, I can tell you in my experience as a school psychologist and a teacher for, for, for a very long time, I see the kids on the left side of that screen more than I see the kids uh, on the right uh, who struggle. I see those mixed reading difficulties a lot, and I see those specific word recognition difficulties a lot. I rarely see kids who have good uh, decoding skills and good word reading skills, but struggle with comprehension. They do exist, but more likely I'm seeing kids who struggle with the mixed reading difficulties and the specific word recognition difficulties. And that's where those, that those the kids who, who have a specific learning disability in reading or dyslexia fall in that category. That's what dyslexia is. That's sort of at its core, what we're thinking about when we're talking about dyslexia. It's kids who struggle with learning to decode and learning to read at an automatic level. Now, um, there's a lot of mythology out there about dyslexia. There's a lot of things that dyslexia is not. And I want to cover a few of those right now. And you could probably identify even more that I've not, I've not heard yet or that I'm just missing, but let's go over a few of them. Uh, the first one, the myth, dyslexia is a disorder that causes individuals to see uh, and write letters and words backwards and or that causes words to jump around the page when reading. I've heard this one a lot and I've heard it for many, many years. Uh, I can tell you this is not true. Um, the reality is uh, that, oh, you, you're skipping on me, doctor. That's all right, thank you. The truth is that dyslexia is a problem with phonemic decoding of sound and is not a visual problem. Kids, there's no evidence to suggest that words are moving around the page. There's no evidence that words are let and letters are being flipped. I can tell you, I remember back in the 80s, and I know this is how old I am, there was a couple of, there was a movie of the week that came on where it kind of talked about that. And somehow that got embedded in the mythology of dyslexia. It's just not true. The, the, the truth is the errors that kids who are diagnosed with dyslexia and specific learning disabilities make in terms of letter reversals and just misordering when they're reading uh, are developmentally typical for kids who are behind in reading. Go ask any kindergarten teacher you know if kids reverse letters. Yes, they all do. And it's just part of learning let your letters. The kids we see that, are, that have dyslexia they struggle with this because they are developmentally behind and that developmental trajectory uh, will, 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 if given good instruction, these errors will, will fade away over time, but it requires good instruction. So the next myth, dyslexia is a sign that a person is unintelligent. Clearly not true. The reality is dyslexia is, does not discriminate based upon intellectual ability. Uh, some kids with dyslexia are have high IQ. Some kids have lower IQs. It, it's no correlation that we've been able to find that, to link intelligence with dyslexia. Either way, both unintelligent and intelligent. I've seen. I've also seen uh, where they talk about kids with dyslexia or have high intelligence, uh, and some of them do, but some of them have average to below average IQs. It's got nothing to do with the cognitive ability. The next myth, colored overlays improve reading skills of children with dyslexia. Seen this one out there for years also. Uh, the belief that laying a colored piece of paper over uh, words that a kid can't read all of a sudden makes them able to read those words. Sounds silly if you think about it. It doesn't work. Uh, there's been some research on it and in general, colored overlays do not improve reading accuracy or fluency. The only thing that colored overlays can do is provide a temporary and brief increase in attention to the to the colored overlays, which will not help build reading skills. So if you've seen this out there or people are suggesting that this is going to help kids with dyslexia, I promise you it will not help. Uh, next one, uh, there is only one specific way to treat dyslexia 
and this treatment is unique and different from other effective reading interventions and supports. Again, you see this out there uh, quite often. This is a dyslexia reading program. This is a reading program for kids with specific learning disabilities. Uh, and the reality is, it's not. Um, the reality is things that work uh, for normally developing kids work for kids with dyslexia. There's not one specific treatment for dyslexia. Research indicates that children with a dyslexia diagnosis typically respond well to evidence-based interventions that target their specific skills, such as decoding skills. So if you wanna uh, teach a kid with dyslexia to read, identify their weaknesses and provide evidence-based intervention in those areas, and that will improve their reading. Not a dyslexia program. There's, uh, there is no research that indicates that any programs work better for kids with dyslexia than kids without dyslexia. It's just not the case. Good reading instruction works for all kids. Now, current evidence supports a dynamic treatment-focused model for dyslexia identification and treatment best implemented within an MTSS model. And I wanna show you what, what we're talking about with an MTSS model. Dr. Rich and I, have uh, been training on MTSS models for, for quite some time. And we really like the way it supports teachers and schools in identifying who needs help and providing them with that help in a systematic manner. Because what we don't wanna do when we identify kids who need supports, whether they be at risk for dyslexia, have a learning disability, or just are behind, we want to provide them that support in as an efficient manner, in an, as an efficient as possible manner. Uh, so research indicates that best practices for both identification of dyslexia risk factors and remediation this is, uh, of deficits associated with dyslexia is a multi-tiered system of support. And now this works very simply. Uh, and obviously, I'll be oversimplifying this. It's, it's much more complicated than this in actual practice. But uh, it starts out with a systematic method of screening students for reading difficulties. If you want to know who needs extra support, if you want to know who uh, needs intervention, you assess your population. And that's what the, uh, uh, the purpose of the Reading Sufficiency Act and now the dyslexia screening uh, legislation are. They're designed to identify who is at risk for these uh, concerns so we can provide evidence-based intervention early. And that's what step two is. Once we identify who needs supports, we provide them those supports within this tiered model of instruction. Once we do that, we progress monitor. See, what, see if our interventions that we put in place for these kids who are at risk is working. And if it is, great. We look at our data and we make decisions as to whether or not we wanna continue those supports, intensify those supports, or remove those supports if the problem has been resolved. Okay, Dr. Rich. Next thing we're gonna do is Dr. Rich is gonna talk a little bit about dyslexia in the schools, what it means to be a student at risk for dyslexia, both legally and practically. All right. Thanks, Dr. Juhan. So um, I think as we started out saying a lot of people are interested in this topic, but it's it's very complicated. Um, however, there has been a lot of um, work done here in Oklahoma to try to provide more guidance on what does it mean and ultimately what what are we supposed to be doing for our children? So let's start from a legal perspective. Some of you guys might just tune out during this and that's fine. I'm kind of a nerd and I like the legal side of it. So I was um, having fun kind of digging in to the history of reading legislation in Oklahoma. So um, uh, most people have heard of RSA or the Reading Sufficiency Act um, in Oklahoma. However, it really wasn't, um, it, it, come to, it didn't really come to the forefront of our knowledge and what we did in education until in the last 10 years is really when it's become kind of prominent. Um, so most people don't realize that it actually was first introduced in 1997. And really the goal of that legislation just said, we need all our students to be on grade level by third grade. Um, from a federal level, this is no child left behind language and Oklahoma's adoption of that language said, hey, let's make sure all our kids are reading on grade level by third grade. 
2009, that was amended to really emphasize, hey, to get our kids to read on level, let's give them support and let's identify those students who have some issues. So first it was just get our kids on level. Then there was a little bit more direction of schools. You need to be identifying students who have needs and you need to be supporting those struggling readers. And then starting in 2011, there came this um, the mandatory retention of those students who score unsatisfactory on the third grade reading test. And so this is, again, where it really came to the forefront because there was some um, real life accountability and um, direct impact on our students and our families when they did not pass that third grade reading test. And then from there, um, 2014, there were some more amendments and this Reading Sufficiency, Sufficiency Act, RSA, has really been um, amended or changed in trying to provide as much guidance while maintaining local control at each school district. Um, so you can see there, this it's been 2014, 15, 16, 17, 19, they've had revisions of it. And with each of those revisions, so that's the law that our legislators do, our agency, our State Department of Education then has to take that law and provide us as teachers, educators, families, guidance on how that law looks and what does the application of it look like. So that's where we're at on the reading sufficiency. Another component, though, to reading legislation in Oklahoma is dyslexia, which is what we're talking about today. So the first dyslexia um, legislation in Oklahoma really came about in 2012. It was a law that um, said to have a teacher to training pilot program. So for training pre-service teachers, teachers who did not have their degree yet, and making sure they understood what dyslexia is and how to address it. Um, and then from there in 2017, there was a law that said we need a task force in Oklahoma that comes up with what is Oklahoma going to do about dyslexia. And that task force, the result of it, it met for about two and a half years. And the result of that is that they came out with the dyslexia handbook. Um, so that dyslexia handbook, you can access it on the State Department of Education. The next step for that handbook is to be officially um, a law to go through to say that that's going to be Oklahoma's official adoption of how we handle dyslexia. And then our State Department of Education, again, coming up with the policies and procedures that would go around that. So that one is still sort of in progress. Then 2019, we said, okay, we, we tried to do teacher training pre-service. We have a lot of teachers out there, though, that still don't know what's, you know, all the characteristics, and it's com it's complicated. So let's provide some more training to our teachers. So beginning last year, part of the annual training that teachers go through is that they do have to go through dyslexia training. Um, and then the big thing this year and why we're all here right now is that in 2020, they did pass a law that starting this year, every student K through three is going to be screened for dyslexia if they have reading concerns. And so that's where we're at right now. And we'll talk about what does that practically mean from uh, that legislation into the hands of what does that mean for you all on a day to day in your schools or with your children? Um, the our State Department of Education has done a really nice job of providing guidance for this. And so a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about right now are pulled from this implementation guidance document. I will have a link for this in the presentation that you guys can access. But if you just search that on Google, you can find it as well. But it goes through okay, this new law started. What do schools have to do? <laughs> and going through what it means. This is where it gets really tricky. So you know how Dr. Duhan was saying dyslexia and specific learning disability, they're interchangeable and very much so. Both are disabilities, disorders that affect children's reading. However, it gets really confusing because, and this is explicitly stated in that implementation guidance from our State Department of Education, in Oklahoma, when we say we've done screening for dyslexia 
and a student is at risk for dyslexia, that does not mean they have dyslexia. That does not mean they have a diagnosis of it. It does not mean that they have a specific learning disability. All that means is that they're having reading difficulties in some of those areas we talked about, the accurate and fluent word reading, spelling, phonological awareness. So it means, hey, this is a red flag for reading problems, but it does not mean they have a disability. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind as we go through this, that we, when we do dyslexia screening in the schools, we are not screening necessarily for a disability. We're screening for reading problems and we're screening for skills that we can intervene on. And that's the goal of this legislation. That's the goal of um, all of the work that the State Department has done with Reading Sufficiency Act. It's not to identify students with learning disabilities. It's to identify the er students who have reading problems and again, get them up to reading level. We still have that initial goal of we want our third grade students reading on third grade level. So this is the steps for reading and dyslexia screening in Oklahoma. So step one is that all kindergarten through third grade students in Oklahoma are screened on an approved reading screener. And we'll look at a list of those here in a minute, but they're all screened on reading. This new step, step two, is what's been added this year. Any student who's flagged on that step one as having reading concerns, then the school needs to consider specific characteristics that are associated with dyslexia. And so those characteristics are back to that phonemic awareness, phonological, uh, or phonemic understanding, phonological awareness, decoding skills, word reading skills. Sometimes that means another assessment needs to be done. Sometimes it's just analyzing the data that they already have from the screening. And then step three, all those students on step one who are identified as having reading problems, whether or not they have features or dyslexia or not, all of them will need a reading plan to help address the deficits. And those reading plans will address the deficits identified through the screening and the dyslexia screening. And then step four is we progress monitor. We see, does, does it work? And if it's not working, we need to intensify. We need to change. We need to make sure we come up with some plan that's going to address reading and affect that or help that student make benefits. Um, one of the things that we um, know is that all students can learn to read. You might be like, I don't know. I've met a few that haven't, but research shows all students can learn to read with the appropriate amount of support. And so we're really trying to figure out how much support does a student need. And sometimes that it might end up being the student has a disability that's going to require special education services, but most students are not going to require that level of support. Dr. Duhon, anything else on that before we kind of dig into these steps here? We did have one question in the uh, in the comments that I wanted that might be a good time to address. The one associated uh, and I, um, one of the uh, anonymous attendees indicated that when these screeners are coming back with dyslexia written on them, uh, school districts are getting overloaded with requests for evaluation because the screener has uh, says dyslexia, and I, I I get that that's a legitimate concern. Um, and I think uh, wherever this anonymous uh, question came from, they're not unique in the state of Oklahoma. Um, it is it is a concern. And my my only guidance I can give districts would be to make sure that we communicate effectively with parents early before these things happen. What it what a screener is, you know, and what it's not. And I hopefully some of the information we have here, they can extract out and use that to support, uh, support districts in communicating effectively with parents so they don't think just because they flagged on the screen or means they have dyslexia or means they need to be tested. That's a problematic in that it's a, it it's, should not be our first solution to a, a flag of a screener is to test the kid for a disability. It should be to identify the needs and intervene. 
um, before we do anything else. Yeah, absolutely. So we're um we're gonna go through some more like in depth on these steps. Um I think that one of the um open communication is one of the things. And um the first step is you all and who are educators in here are understanding the difference in this language so that you can speak confidently about this to parents. The other piece of it is when like I work with parents on a weekly basis and when they come in and they're talking about these reading concerns, they're not necessarily wanting a label. They think that label leads to intervention. And so when we can help direct them to look, this can be a tool to help us identify what skills and here's our plan to address the skills. And that's really what parents want. That's really what us as teachers want as educators. We want the student to make progress. And um, so hopefully some of this will give you some language to help communicate that to families. Um, when we look at uh, universal screening, so in general, uh, um, as Dr. Duhan said, we are huge proponents of the multi-tiered systems of support and a bit, uh, primary feature of that is universal screening. So this is our first step in identifying students who are at risk for learning difficulties and who may need additional support. I like to think of universal screening as um, like a temperature check. Like, do you have a fever? Could something possibly be wrong? It doesn't give you a whole lot of information. If your child has a fever, that doesn't necessarily tell you what's wrong, but it helps give you a, is something wrong? And um, these screening assessments are usually very brief, take three to 10 minutes per student, depending on the screener. Um, Oklahoma has done a really nice job of providing you all guidance on ones that um, research uh, their evidence base, they have val validity and reliability if they are done as intended. So the people doing them have to be trained on how to do it and you have to make sure they're doing it consistently and re um, reliably. But if they're done the way they're supposed to, then they should give you good outcome measures and good birth predictability about which students actually do have reading problems. And the most important thing is we use it for all students. So when we talk about who's screened in Oklahoma specifically for reading, it is all kindergarten through third grade students, all of them. It's not the ones that we think might have reading problems. It's not the ones that we know their brother had some problems. And so now we're going to screen them. It's all students who come through our door and are enrolled for kindergarten through third grade my, um, it, on a more global sense, I think you should be doing screening for all grades, but legally you need to do it for kindergarten through third. We do it three times per year. That beginning of the year, catch those students early who we know have problems so we can start intervening early and we're not waiting for them to fail in order to start helping them. The middle of the year, because we know some students just, they can't quite keep up and we don't catch them till the middle of the year. They might initially come in on level and then they start to have trouble keeping up with that grade level material. And then the end of the year tells us how well we did over the year and helps us plan for next year. So we know which students ended behind that we're going to probably need to support the next year. This also helps us evaluate our system as a whole of are the majority of our students meeting our benchmarks or do we have a majority behind and maybe we need to do some more of this like tier one level support that everyone gets extra support. When we look at screening assessments, these are the ones that have been approved by the State Department of Education and our board last in 2021 for this year. And um, so schools, select from this list based off what works best for their schools. Um, they will um, provide training to teachers on how to administer it. Most of these companies will come and do those trainings or provide videos to ensure that all teachers know how to administer these. If you're a teacher and you have not had training on how to administer this, this might be something to talk to your administrator about of getting that extra training on how do we administer this and what do these scores mean when we get them? Then that step two is the dyslexia screening. Back to that really confusing language. <laughs> really what this is intended to provide is additional information 
for those students who have reading difficulties and risk of dyslexia. It does not provide a diagnosis of dyslexia or any other reading disability. It's a diagnosis of skills, not children. This dyslexia screening is telling us what skills they need to work on. It is not diagnosing individual children. So when we look at this, who needs to be screened? Again, from a legal perspective, all students in first through third grade who were below the 40th percentile, which I'll talk about 40th percentile and what that means here in a second, on that RSA screening at the beginning of the year, then get a dyslexia screening. Our kindergarten students, we're giving them a little bit of time. We're giving them the first half of the year to, because they're coming in from all different areas. Some of them, that's their first time in school. Some of them have been in early childhood programs. Some of them have gone through preschool. Um, so all kindergartners who are below the 40th percentile on the middle of the year screening then have a dyslexia screening, okay? These are designed, these dyslexia screenings are designed to be um, implemented and done by our general education teachers. They, again, um, sometimes we do use specialists, sometimes we do use reading interventionists or other people to administer this, but um, again, your team at the State Department of Education did a very thorough review of different dyslexia screener components out there and were thoughtful in selecting ones that were designed to be implemented by general education teachers who have been trained on how to administer and interpret the data. So again, another piece there, our general ed teachers need to know how to do these and how to interpret this data. And then hopefully this is being done within a multi-tiered system of support where there's a teaming process. And as a team, you guys can review that data and help make decisions about it. These are the dyslexia approved screeners. So you'll see there's overlap between the general RSA screeners that I just showed you and the dyslexia screeners. Some of these like Amira, Map Reading Fluency and Star CBM, that's all you have to do. If you've done that as your RSA screener, you can use that data for your dyslexia screener too. Some of them require supplements. Some of them require this um, a little bit more information on phonological awareness and phonemic skills. And so the again, they we've offered or the State Department has offered this free um, assessment called the PAST, which is a phonological awareness screening test that teachers can administer. It's a it it's very similar to probably what a lot of teachers learn in their reading instruction class. It's an inventory of letter sounds, digraphs, um, rhymings, and it's just going through with the student and tracking which of those skills do they know, which of them do they not know. And it's really useful in helping say, here's where the student's at, and these are the skills we need them to know. Um, prior to administration, it's really, it's, so it's a free tool, but there is some training out there. There's a video that teachers can watch and there's also a manual with step-by-step -step guidance. Again, make the emphasis that it does not diagnose dyslexia. It diagnoses skills or identifies skills in phonological awareness and phonemic awareness um, <laughs> that we can address in those interventions. Um, before I move on from there into intervention planning, Dr. Duhan, anything else on kind of the screening process that you think we need to emphasize? No, I think you, I think the, the, you did a great job. The biggest take home from the screening is the screening is not to identify who might have dyslexia, it's really to identify what the deficits in skill are uh, so that interventions can be tailored to the individual student needs, period. Um, beyond that, uh, and, and uh, you know, beyond that, I understand where the confusion comes from, and we just need to do our best to, uh, in our due diligence to make sure that parents are aware of what a screener is, what it does, uh, and what it doesn't do. Absolutely. So, 
And then here's really the meat of it. This, this is what I think it's, it's the plan. It's the reading intervention plan. It's what do we do about these skill deficits? Um, so we have been so focused, I think, within our discussions on what does it mean to screen? What does it mean for the RSA? What do we need to do this? Um, or what forms do we have to fill out? What do we need to communicate to parents? And those are all important components that we need to understand. But the meat of it comes down to this individualized program of reading instruction, which again, through all the iterations of RSA, this has had many different names, but the last few years we've stuck with the IPRI or Individualized Program of Reading Instruction. So if a student does not meet the 40th percentile on the RSA screening, we do an IPRI. We, we do that. Step back and just kind of give you, um, again, for my, my data nerds, research nerds, I'm going to give you a little more information on 40th percentile and what that means. So all of those reading screenings that were selected by as options that schools can use, they all have what we call national normative data, where they have given this assessment to thousands of kids, and they have come up with a normal curve of a score of X means average range. They've also come up with what we call percentile ranks. So a score of X might be at the 40th percentile. That means that any child that scores that X score is going to be scoring at or better than 40% of other kids in that normative range. So on average, they're scoring at or better than 40% of other kids in their grade is the way that I usually explain it to parents. So thinking about kind of like a growth curve or you go, you take your kid for a well child visit and they say their, their height's at the 99th percentile. That means they're as tall as about 99% of other kids or tall, other kids in their age. Same thing for 40th. They're reading at or better than 40% of other kids in their age. Research has shown that if they're not at that 40th percent level, they may not pass their state reading test. It doesn't mean for sure they're going to fail, but it means they may not pass it. And so that's where we're saying that's a flag. They might have some reading difficulties. We need to dig in a little bit more. We need to provide an intervention. Those intervention plans should address whatever skills were identified on the reading screening and the dyslexia screening. And that's the goal of those screenings is to identify skills and develop a plan. Um, this is again from the RSA information. So Oklahoma has given this guidance through RSA on what does it, how do you use that reading screening data and how do you differentiate what level of services a student may receive so any student who's at or above the 40th percentile, they keep getting their 90 minutes a day of regular instruction in reading. If they're between the 26th and 39th percentile, then they're going to get what we call differentiated instruction. This is probably still going to be part of the regular reading that everyone gets, except they might have a small group that I works on a specific skill deficit that has been identified for them. So they might be working on a vocabulary skills or they might be working on um, sight word development, something within the differentiation there. Tier two is for those students who fall between that 11th and 25th percentile. So at or better between 11 to 25% of other kids in their age or grade group. Um, these students still gonna get all of that tier one, tier one with differentiation, they still get all of that. But now we're going to add in a supplemental instructional group for them and an intervention for them. And we'll talk about how you know what interventions to select and what you select, but they're going to get those. Um, it's going to be three to five days a week, at least 15 minutes in addition to everything that is within that tier one. This might be the general education teacher. It might be an interventionist or a specialist that works with them. And then tier three is for our students who are in that first to 10th percentile. So our lowest 10% of, based off those national norms. Still gonna get 
all of that tier one instruction. But now we're going to add on some extra interventions, usually daily. Usually they're pulled out in a smaller group. And usually these are done by a specialist or an intervention specialist um, for that piece of it. So we've already addressed this, but I just want to make sure we address it one more time. Are there specific interventions for dyslexia? No. Um, that first slide we showed you was from research um, in 2013. I wanted to make sure I was still up to date on all of my dyslexia research. So I did a good search of everything that's out there. And I did find a 2022 article that reviewed 40 years of dyslexia research. And it said that Interventions for students who are at risk for dyslexia had similar effect sizes, so similar response to interventions as those that were more defined as just reading deficits. So it didn't really matter if the student had dyslexia or just reading deficit, the interventions worked about the same. Also, some of those interventions that were considered multi-sensory. And so what we say by multi-sensory is they were advertised as saying, hey, we, you work with like tactile while you're reading, or you're doing this physical movement, or you've got all these sensories activated while you're learning reading. Research indicates that there's not a difference in multi-sensory versus interventions that are not multi-sensory. So there doesn't seem to be any added benefit of multi-sensory interventions. And then very, um, I think kind of biggest takeaway is that the largest moderator or the largest thing that did have an effect on the intervention effectiveness was how often they did the intervention, its dosage. How, off, how much intervention services did the student really get? Um, and Dr. Duhon can probably talk for days about dosage of interventions. That's one of his research areas, but we know that that's a huge moderator for the effectiveness of these interventions if we have a good intervention to begin with. You have to have a good intervention to begin with, but once you have that, giving it more often can have um, an effect, a positive effect there. Anything else on that, Dr. Duhon, you wanna say? No, no, I think it's perfect. Uh, you know, good reading interventions work for all kids, period. Yep. And that's that's the summary there. And that's um, for you all who are, you know, having these discussion with parents. And I, I completely understand. Um, and we'll talk about more of the special education pieces of it here in a minute. But that that's your takeaway. Good interventions for reading work for all kids. That's it. Um, and so really, and this is kind of emphasizes that as well. When we're selecting interventions, we should be selecting it based on the skills that the student's missing, not based on any kind of label, not because they have a specific learning disability, not because they're at risk for dyslexia, not because they have a traumatic brain injury. I mean, anything. It should be based on what skills are they missing and what do we need to do to address those skill deficits. So um, someone put in the chat about selecting tier three interventions. I do have some resources for you on that. So interventions, just in general, the definition here, they're strategies designed to build an academic skill. So we do lots of accommodations, modifications, and intervention is going to teach a skill and it's going to build a skill. So if you're trying to decide if it's an intervention or not, think about what skill did it build? There are several resources out there about how do we know if an intervention is evidence-based. What Works Clearinghouse does a good job of just giving you general um, information about programs that are out there and the research that has been there. And I'm going to show you all that one. So if you go to What Works Clearinghouse, you can click on literacy and then you can type in a specific um, you can search or you can, it has this list of interventions. We'll just click on this first one. I don't know anything about it. It tells you how effective it has been in these different areas. So it doesn't really improve cognition or math skills. It's improving oral language, phonological processing and print awareness. And then it gives you a summary of this. So 
nice, sort of easy to read. You can get into the technical details of it, but it gives you what works here. The other one, and especially our question on um, tier three interventions, I really like this National Center on Intensive Interventions. This is um, a federally funded project through the American Institute for Research, and it provides what we call data-based um, instruction and the components to what do you do for those intensive interventions. It has on here this tools chart. It has screening and progress monitoring measures. It also has an intervention chart where it gives you evidence of the effectiveness of these different programs. You can select like reading grade 12 or grade K through five, sorry. And then it will, all the ones that they've reviewed, it gives you those study. And then it gives you information about the quality of the study. Was it a good number of participants? Like, did we have enough to really say if it was good? Did they look at the fidelity, like how well they were doing it? Did it have specific measures it was targeting? Um, it talks about the intensity, so like the group size, how long it takes, and then any additional research that they have on it. So this is a really good um, tool that if you're looking for reading programs and interventions um, that provides that evidence there. Another thing that, um, again, through the dyslexia resources that are provided through the State Department is this general approach to structured literacy. Um, and this is what we know are, um, <laughs> excuse me, the evidence-based practices for appropriate reading instruction. So we know that we need to model and clearly explain new concepts. We know that we have to be very explicit in our instruction with especially students who do have reading problems. They don't just naturally absorb it. We've got to be explicit in what we're trying to teach them. Um, something that often doesn't occur is the prerequisite skills. So thinking going all the way back. And again, that dyslexia screener and the screening should help with this. Like, does the student have basic letter knowledge? to first know letter sounds and making those connections? Do they have basic letter sounds down before they start decoding and connecting that? So where are they at in that continuum? Um, making sure they have meaningful interactions with language during the lesson. So there's some, they understand why we're talking about this. It's connected to broader skills and multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities for the student to practice the skills. And that's really when we talk about dosage, that's one of the things that has a huge impact is how many opportunities did that student have to practice the skill? Um, are they well targeted for corrective feedback? Is the student encouraged? Are we really scaffolding for, and moving from that teacher supported to independent skills? And then finally, making sure that our students are moving on and advancing. So there's a lot more information on the State Department of Education about structured literacy approach. I just wanted to put it out there as a general approach that we know works for students with reading concerns or students who are learning to read, period, <laughs> at any point. Dr. Rich, before you move on, I, I, I'll say one more thing uh, about intervention, because one of the one of the. Uh, questions came up, what if you don't have the resources or the personnel to run these interventions? And that's always a struggle in schools is finding the personnel and the resources to make this happen. Uh, and the guide, the only guidance I can give you on this forum, uh, there's other options, there's other resources and guides we can give you and would, it would take more time, is sometimes we have to look at the big picture. Uh, if we have a lot of kids requiring tier two and tier three interventions, maybe our tier one's not working effectively and we need to back up and really think about how we're how we're utilizing our uh cool reading instruction is it an effective reading instruction because if if you're overwhelmed too many kids are in tier three then maybe an indication something else is not functioning well in the system uh dr rich i'm going to sign off now i've got to i've got to get to another uh meeting but uh great job thank you guys for for having me and uh Dr. Rich has all the answers to all of our questions.
<laughs> sure, I do. I'm just gonna have you guys email them to him. <laughs> him <That's a> <laughs> so yes. So so yeah, I, I'll kind of back up real quick on just to emphasize what he said on that piece of it. When we're looking at those tiered levels, if our triangles upside down and we have a large majority of our students in this tier two and tier three range, then maybe we need to really consider boosting up our tier one. Um, and I've even seen schools boost up their tier one, do real intensive like phonics instruction for six weeks and then rescreen their kids to see do we still have this high level needing tier two and tier three support. So definitely um, being thoughtful and efficient with your resources is a huge piece to that. All right. Um, I'm going to go back. Joanne, did you have a comment or? Yeah, I had uh, a couple of comments. Yeah. I wanted to just um, say for parents who might be on here, as just a parent who doesn't have the educational training, doesn't really know how reading is taught, it looks like magic. I mean, you start out with a child and you're showing them words and a lot of child's children just pick it up and they start reading on their own. But it really is a science and there are really component parts. And there's generally five that teachers learn to do in actually doing reading instruction. And those are composed of phonemic awareness, which is your letters and sounds phonics, which is kind of the same, I guess you could explain it probably better than me, but the fluency in which they read, the vocabulary they understand, and their general comprehension of what they're reading. And so when all of this is talking about the skills, they're looking in one of those five areas to see, do a deep dive. Where is the child struggling and learning to understand these words or understand what they mean? And it is a science. And so there isn't that simple thing of you're a reader or you're a bad reader. It's really complex. And I'm not really sure parents really even understand that. And, you know, one of the things maybe schools could look at doing is as a group coming together for some explanations to parents about what is the teaching of reading? What does it involve? Um, I think the information you've given is great. Um, it gives people, uh, educators, a lot of questions. I also wanted to ask you, are you there at the Bridge Center to support schools who are struggling if they need help? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I we, we've got several projects on really helping with that um, setting up those systems and that multi-tiered system to make sure that you are, you know, you're effectively using those processes, using your progress monitoring data, using this process to get everything there. Um, so yeah, and I love your idea of coming together and having some conversations with parent or coming up with some language that can help parents understand this. Um, I've also, so I, I, I know through schools I've worked with, we've done literacy nights, we've done, you know, inviting parents, we don't always get the best response when we try to do that. But when you do have these parents really questioning, what does it mean that you just sent a letter home saying my child has dyslexia or characteristics of dyslexia, and um, using your colleagues and resources to come up with some shared language, I think can be really important. Yeah, and I wanted to say something again that when I was in Washington and first learning about response to intervention which is that MTSS model that multi-tiered system of supports um, they were saying that when you go through RTI it's really a process on how to drill down and see what skills the child is weak on and what they need to have what they need to have curriculum and support so that they can help in those individual skills. So we have been having a lot of parents call us and saying, the school said that my child is has dyslexia characteristics and is a risk, uh, risk for dyslexia. So I would like to have them evaluated by a psychologist. Well, you can have them evaluated and it may show some of those same things, um, but um, it's not going to help the school 
determine what RTI determines, which is what are the interventions that child needs. So even if you do the evaluation and it says, yes, there are, looks like the child is having problems here, it is not helping you find the interventions that they need. And I think those are things that might be helpful to explain to parents, um, because I think your point is well made that parents see testing and being in special ed as the intervention process. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is change the way, in my mind, it looks like, change the way we approach teaching reading in our state. And yeah. hopefully it will be a better system of teaching. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanna make sure we have some time for this kind of discussion and questions. I did want to um, just quickly show you kind of what you're talking about, Joanne, as far as the difference between, um, when we are looking at special education services and what we consider for that, and then also what we consider um, from more of a medical diagnosis of a dyslexia or specific learning disorder. So we do, the progress monitoring here is really key to those things that Joanne's talking about, because that's how we know if the student's responding to the intervention and not just, again, all students can respond to the, the right intervention, but are they gonna make growth at the rate that they need to meet their goal? Or do we need to provide a higher level of support that might come out in the form of special education? Um, so I'm going to skip a little bit because I do have the special education services piece on here. So special education uses this broad term of saying this is when we are talking about a disability. So now we're finally actually talking about a disability here. So the student would be identified as having a specific learning disability, which includes dyslexia. And so uh, there used to be a huge misnomer and, and contradictions in schools where schools said, we don't test for dyslexia. That's not true. Schools can test for dyslexia, but not every student who has risk of dyslexia needs to be tested for it. it and that's where it gets really confusing. Um, so when a school does suspect, hey, there, there's... Or, there might be a concern that this is an actual disability. This this is pretty low. We've done interventions. They're not making progress. Or a parent can request and say, I I'm really concerned that you all are doing all these interventions and they're still not making progress. They can request an evaluation. The school then needs to do what's called a review of existing data or, or REDS form. And what they're going to document on that REDS form is all of that intervention data. And they're going to take a look and say, is there enough evidence to say this student's probably going to need more support than what we can provide in the general education classroom alone? And they're probably going to need specialized services due to what we think is a disability. And if that's where the school's at, then they'll do an evaluation. They'll use that RTI data or that MTSS intervention data as part of that. They'll also probably do an IQ test to just make sure nothing else is going on. They'll do some observations to make sure there's no behavioral things that are affecting it. Um, but that intervention and progress monitoring data will be used as part of that process. Um, then there's the other side. And I think what a lot of parents are doing right now is they're getting that letter and they're saying, okay, you told me my child's at risk for dyslexia. So they're calling their pediatrician and their pediatrician is saying, I know this lady, Dr. Rich at OSU who can evaluate for learning disorders. And so we are getting quite a few of those referrals in our clinic. It's more of what we call a medical diagnosis. And special education, this gets really confusing. They call it a specific learning disability and they use the federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act to define that. And part of that definition is the response to intervention. Also, schools will use um, cognitive and achievement testing. In my private practice clinic here at OSU, I use what's called the DSM or Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders. This is the medical diagnosis of psychological and neurodevelopmental disorders. To have, I will tell you guys, 
it is incredibly difficult for me as a private practitioner to tell you if your child has a specific learning disorder, including dyslexia, because that definition, I have to be able to show that that student has learning and academic difficulties that have persisted despite the provision of interventions that target the difficulties, which means I need RTI data. I need intervention data to make that diagnosis. And rarely are parents bringing me the progress monitoring data. Rarely are schools sending me that, that I could make that diagnosis. And so there was a question on here about other people that can diagnose dyslexia, look at dyslexia. There are lots of professionals who have expertise in reading, phonological awareness, phonemic awareness. They can provide information. What I can do is I can say this student is so far below um, their level of where they should be academically, but I don't know what their response to intervention has looked like. And so it's really hard to make that diagnosis outside of the schools. Um, this is again, just sort of the DSM pieces on here. This is all on the handouts. I won't read that to you, um, but the DSM-5, I do wanna say it defines dyslexia as an alternative term used to refer to a pattern of learning that's characterized by problems of accurate or fluent word recognition, poor decoding, and poor spelling abilities. But that has to be couched within how did that student respond to um, interventions and that piece of it. Um, so when a school does receive an outside evaluation saying this child has dyslexia or this child has a specific learning disability or disorder, they do that same thing. They do a review of existing data. They look and see, is there enough evidence to show that we need to do more evaluations here? How do we support the student? And the school will then have to make that um, assessment. I, as a private practitioner, cannot tell a school that a student needs an IEP. Um, and so I think that's the other thing for parents to know that there's only so much an outside professional can do to influence um, the team process that the parents should be part of within the school systems. I'm going to stop sharing right here and make sure we have time to get the rest of the questions. Um, get that. And then Joanne, does that help clarify kind of what you were talking about as far as the questions you all have been getting? Um, and I will, as they're going through that, so making sure I've got all the questions. I did see a question here of um, the adaptive behavior as a required component for a specific learning disability. I that is a new change to the updated policies and procedures. I'm going to have to defer to the State Department of Education and their special ed team on that. Um, my understanding is that they did a big scour of um, the legal requirements and thought that adaptive behavior was something that needed to be added as part of the what their their interpretation of the federal regulations. So. Um, but I would refer to the State Department to provide a little more information on that piece of it. See what other questions have come up. Look over in the Q&A, can you see that one? Can an eye doctor diagnose dyslexia? Um, so no, <laughs> unless that eye doctor is, um, has a lot of um, experience in reading and phonological awareness and, and is able to look at the response to intervention data and that progress monitoring. Um, there is this idea of a convergence disorder that affects reading, um, but that is, again, we can of address the that's not dyslexia in the most accepted terms of what we've been talking about. Okay, there's an anonymous attendee who asked, but when we send out this screener with dyslexia on it, parents rightfully become concerned when they're flagged and want further testing. We're getting overloaded in the school by evaluation requests. I wish we could screen for these without labeling it dys, uh, dyslexia screener. And I think we've addressed that. Yeah, um, I think we did address that one. And, and I would say, you know, I, 
I've asked, I, I've heard other professionals say the the only thing that's, you know, problematic about this dyslexia screening is we're calling it dyslexia screening. It's really good practice because we're getting down mm -hmm. to the individual um, skills, but it's confusing. The language. Yeah, it's really a reading screener, <laughs> just exactly. reading mm -hmm. scale screener. Yeah. yeah. And there's another one that just says, or other related service providers such as OT or SLP. And I'm not sure what that was referring to. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that was referring to. I don't know if that's referring to the diagnostic piece or to the, um, or which piece there. The interventionist, maybe. It says, what, what if you do not have an interventionist for tier three? So maybe it was saying, could you use those. I don't yeah. know. And, and I will say um, SLP, so speech language therapists and occupational therapists are in incredibly helpful in this domain, um, they, especially when we are looking at those language skills um, and that uh, phonemic um, connections on just initial sounds and understanding sounds for the speech language therapist, the connections between um, the writing components and the spelling components um, can be very helpful. Again, when we're talking about risk for dyslexia, it, it's supposed to be set up. So this is our general education teachers. And, and this is really something that our, our specialists can help support our general ed teachers. But this is supposed to be for that when we're doing interventions and um, the diagnostic pieces. And if we are considering a specific learning disability, then definitely individual students would probably benefit from more direct interventions and um, assessments from OTs and SLPs. And then, yeah, I see that next one. I think we addressed this a little bit, but if you don't have an interventionist to do tier three, this is really tricky. Um, and as Dr. Duhan said, it's that multi-tiered system of support is all about um, efficient allocation of your resources. So saying, these are our needs of our students. These are our resources. How do we match them? Um, and so sometimes it is um, getting creative in who does those interventions. The really nice thing is that a lot of the interventions, especially at that tier two level, are um, packaged, like guided things that you can you can teach other kids to do them. Um, you can teach other people to do it as far as, um, as long as they're following the steps. So you can be creative in having like parent volunteers or other resources to help implement some of those tier two and then freeing up other people to do some of the tier three who might have more of the educational background for those more intensive services. Oh, that's a great question. So one that came up, can a student who's been diagnosed with autism and ADHD also have dyslexia? Yes. <laughs> um, so we do have some students that um, kind of have some neurodivergence um, in different ways. And th there are certainly students who meet diagnostic criteria for autism, ADHD, and a learning disorder, including dyslexia. It gets complicated from um, my position as a psychologist in differentiating that and trying to determine are our learning concerns because it's truly a learning disability or have all these other social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties um, impacted their ability to access their education and they've missed instruction. And so again, that's where that response to intervention and that progress monitoring data is going to be really important to show that they have received good quality instruction and that wasn't affected by these other social, emotional, and behavioral things that are going on. Well, it looks like we might be out of questions. I'm not seeing any new ones. And we want to thank you so much, Dr. Rich. This is so important for us to really clarify what's going on. Anytime we see new changes um, in special ed, there's a lot of people who um, just are very confused about it. So we really appreciate this. Um, we've invited the Bridge Center to come back to a webinar in February on reading evaluation results. 
excuse me, I would like you to know that all of these webinars we do are archived on our website. Rob, can you put our website? Um, it's www.okserc.org. And any of our webinars can be used to share with people so that they have a better understanding. If you want to use it for training within your districts, if you want to share it with parents, if you, whatever we can do to help people understand this very complicated issue. So please be sure to review back to that. Rob will be sending you an evaluation. Um, and also, um, Sarah has put in to the chat room uh, questions. If you have any further questions to email her or the Bridge Center, and they will answer those questions. So I wanna thank you so much, Sarah, and you'll have to tell Dr. Duhon, he slipped off before I got to thank him, but we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Well, we appreciate it too. And um, hopefully this helped clarify, not make things more confusing, or at least make mm -hmm. people realize why they're so confused about it. Um, right. And yes, yeah, so we appreciated it. And we are always happy to talk to you all. So please feel free to email us. And we are looking forward to continuing our partnership with um, you all at the Special Education Resource Center. So thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, my video is not working. I don't know what happened. It's not, Rob, you've cut me off again. This happened when we started. But Anyway, I just want to say briefly um, to introduce to you that we are going to be do, doing these webinars on the third Wednesday of every month. Um, let me see if that's working now. Yes, maybe it is. Um, and so next month, we're going to have Dr. Kaylin Cootie come, and she will be doing a webinar on executive functioning. And it will be something that you can also use for training or understanding or send parents to to look at. It will kind of go over what is executive functioning and the impact on students and things that schools can do to address it in the environment. So we think it's another good one to archive. These are kind of the questions we get. We put in some dispute resolution webinars and we also put in issues over calls that we're getting to help people understand and hopefully special education will not be the best kept secret in Oklahoma. <laughs> I always make that joke. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, Rob, is there anything you need to add before we get off? Uh, just simply that the evaluation will come up automatically in your browser as soon as the webinar ends. And it also is so if you can do it right now, that'd be great. Won't take you long. But also, if you don't, if you can't do that, um, it will be included in the follow up email that you'll get. So we appreciate your feedback. We really value it. Thank you very much. Well, goodbye, everyone. And Dr. Rich, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.